Okay, so uh, let's start. So last week um, we have answered the question about uh, how to design a heat exchanger network when we know where the pinch point is located. And there was, uh, I have proposed an algorithm that was able to identify which hot stream is connected with which cold stream. Uh, and then afterwards, what is the structure? Do we have to split streams or do we have to put heat exchange in series or in parallel? <coughs> we have also seen that the, there was a, 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 a that there were some uh, rules that allows us to identify what are the heat loads that were uh, needed. And therefore, as soon as we know the heat loads, then we were able to calculate uh, the heat exchange area that was corresponding. So the, 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 the algorithm is uh, uh, explained here or in mind here. Uh, in which we can see that first we have to identify who are the key streams. And as we know that the pinch is dividing the system into subsystems, above the pinch the streams need to be cooled down, uh, the hot streams need to be cooled down without the help of cold utility, which means that I'm going to use uh, heat recovery to cool down all the hot streams. It means that above the pinch, the key streams are the hot streams. Below the pinch is the reverse. And once I have identified the key streams, then I have some rules that, give, that allows me to be guided towards the design of the heat exchanger. First, I need to have enough core streams to cool down all the hot streams that needs to reach the pinch. So that's the number of streams rule. If I do not find enough, I will have to split the streams in such a way that I will have um, uh, enough cold streams to pull down all the hot streams. And once I have done this, then I have another feasibility rule that is telling me that the CP of the hot stream has to be lower than the CP of the cold streams. And this is done in such a way that the um, that the the uh, uh, heat exchanger remains feasible in the sense that the, the, um, if I know that at the pinch I have the delta T minimum, when I will go away from the pinch, the temperature difference will increase. I know that from the overall point of view, this is already true, but when I'm matching one hot stream with cold streams, it has also to follow the same rule. And this is also the same for all the remaining one, which means that this uh, CP rule has two dimensions. The one that are connected, so the, the CP of the hot stream has to be lower than the CP of the cold stream. And the remaining one needs to follow the same rule as well. So it's a, um, uh, it's a feasibility rule. Once I have identified uh, one feasible connection, I can make the match. And in order to define the heat load, I have to uh, decide to try to uh, satisfy the needs of one of the two streams, being the hot or the cold one. And by doing this, I will be sure that when I'm buying a heat exchanger, it is always for completing, uh, uh, doing the complete job for one of the two streams. Once I have defined this, then I can calculate all the temperatures around the heat exchanger, starting always from the pinch and going, if I'm above the pinch, to higher temperatures, in such a way that I will be able to calculate the remaining problem. And I'll, the, the remaining problem. And the remaining problem is, in fact, the new list of streams in which the one that I have connected in the heat exchanger uh, by, by creating the heat exchanger uh, are not any more available for the rest of the streams. That means that those two, one, the hot and the cold stream in the heat exchanger are not any more available for, for the rest of the streams, which means I can remove them out of the problem. And then I can make the calculation of uh, the new minimum energy requirement or the new maximum heat recovery in the system. And if I'm calculating that the minimum energy requirement is similar to the one that I was already observing before, then I can decide that the heat exchanger is well placed and then I can continue the algorithm and selecting the new one. So I will go back here. I will have again to look at the number of streams and then the MCP to identify the next um, 
heat exchanger. So this is a sequential approach, which means that it would be nice um, to verify that uh, we are on, uh, 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 on the right track and that we are doing the right design. And now today I'm going to explain two different tricks that can be used in order to verify on the one hand that we were doing the calculations in the right place and on the other hand uh, the uh, tricks that allows us to improve the structure of the heat exchanger network design that we have just made. So let's start with um, a technique that allows me to verify if uh, yeah. Go here. Uh, that allows me first to verify that the value of the delta t minimum that I have used is the right one. So you remember that uh, when we have started the heat exchanger network design, we were relying on the fact that we have selected the right delta t minimum. Selecting the right delta t minimum means that we have um, used a value that was in fact based on a typical heat exchanger that we have calculated a priori. So we took the value of one hot stream and one cold stream, supposed to be the right, the, the, the appropriate size. We have then made an optimization that was realizing the compromise between the investment in the heat exchanger and the heat recovery. And from there we have defined the value. And then as soon as we have this, then we, we were um, going down, calculating the minimum energy requirement and the maximum heat recovery, the pinch point position. From the pinch point position, we were able to calculate what were the key streams, etc. So it was everything was based on the fact that we were using the right value for the delta t minimum. So now something that we could perhaps ask ourselves is that are we sure that the delta t minimum that we have selected based on one heat exchanger is the right one? OK, so what we can say is that, OK, but um, perhaps we can formulate the problem the same way as the way we were using uh, when we were uh, making the calculation of the best value of the delta T minimum. Um, we were using this by uh, making the energy capital trade-off. So we can also go back then and say, OK, let's look at the uh, minimum uh, energy requirements that will give us the cost of the energy and then let's try to see if we can calculate the capital cost of the heat exchangers now I'm talking with a plural where I have more than one heat exchanger considered okay so what does it mean it means that from the the heat recovery point of view it's not so complicated to define what is the cost of the hot utility and the cost of the cold utility. On the other hand, to calculate the investment, it means that I have to look at the cost of the sum of all the heat exchangers that needs to be bought uh, in order to realize the heat exchanger network. Now, not only one heat exchanger, but a collection of heat exchangers. Okay? So this part is quite e easy. I'm multiplying the, the, the heat recovery by the cost of the hot utility is easy. This is a little bit more complicated because I do not know where are the heat exchangers and what are the sizes of the different heat exchangers. There is, however, a way to estimate the value of the heat exchanger network. And for doing this, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to look at the hot and cold composite curve. And I'm going to realize that this hot and cold composite curves can be divided into segments where the CP is a constant. So for example, I can take this segment here, which is a vertical segment, and what we can see is that from this temperature to this temperature, uh, with respect to for the hot streams and from this temperature to this temperature for the cold stream, I have a constant CP, which means that I can deduce from this the uh, temperature enthalpy, uh, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the minimum, the, the logarithmic mean of the temperature difference. Like if I was calculating a heat exchanger. Okay, so it means that 
any heat exchanger that proceeds from this temperature to this one and that heat of whole screen from there to there, with this amount of heat load, uh, would follow the same expression of the heat exchange. Which means that for any combination of a hot and a cold stream, in a given temperature interval, I can calculate the heat exchange area, which is in fact the contribution of the hot stream resistance and the cool stream resistance, multiplied by the heat load that I can read here, and the delta T LM, which is the logarithmic mean of the temperature difference which is calculated here. Okay? Which means that I can calculate for each of the small temperature interval what is the the heat load that is uh, the, the heat exchange area that is needed for each connection of a hot and a cold stream. But all the hot and cold streams see the same temperatures in this composite curve. So they see the temperatures which are the limits here. Okay? So it means that now if I would like to know what is the total amount of heat that is exchanged by all the hot streams and all the cold streams, I just have to make the sum. Okay, so and the delta T LM will be the same for everyone. And as a consequence, I can calculate the area that is needed in a temperature in the vertical temperature interval for doing the exchange among all the cold streams and the, all the hot streams that are in the interval. So I can do the list of all the streams in the interval. And therefore, I can uh, make the calculation now. Uh, of the total area, heat exchange area, that is needed by all the hot streams that exchange heat with all the cold streams. Okay, by just now summing up each intervals, one after the other, so that I have the total area that is needed to do the heat recovery, which gives me the total amount of um, area that I have to buy. Okay, so it means that I'm not so far from this equation here, because here I had the sum of the investment of the heat exchange area uh, of, the heat, of the heat exchange area of the heat exchangers. And now here I have at least the value of what is the sum of all the, the, the heat exchangers. Now, what is missing there is the number of heat exchangers, because I know that the cost of one square meter is not the same if it is in a big heat exchanger or in a small heat exchanger. Okay? So it means that it would be nice if I would be able to identify uh, what is the number of heat exchangers. Okay? So, how can we do it? I can look at this, this uh, problem, so I have two hot streams, two cold streams, and the question is, what is the minimum number of heat exchangers that I would need in, uh, for, for this system? Well, what I can say is that if I'm looking at the number of streams that I have, in fact, I have to add first uh, one stream for the hot utility and one stream for the cold utility, which means that I have three hot streams and two and three cold streams in this uh, uh, in this uh, system. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to apply the theory of the graphs that has been uh, established by uh, Euler. And what is important here is that in this balance system, I can always decide that uh, I will reach the minimum number of connections provided that as, as soon as I'm doing one connection between a hot and a cold stream, I will satisfy the needs of one of the two. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is that I'm, I'm going to connect, for example, the hot utility to this stream here. And then I will, uh, uh, it, it means that I will, I will be missing 145 here. The 145, I'm going to take it out of this one, which means that now I will need, uh, I will have a remaining 105 that, can, that I can give to stream B. And then, I can continue like this, and at the end, what we can see is that the number of heat exchangers is equal to the number of hot streams, or the, the total number of streams, including, uh, including the utility, uh, minus, uh, it should have, yeah, minus uh, the number of independent systems, knowing that the whole system is independent because it is balanced. Okay? 
So it means that now I can calculate how much uh, heat exchangers I need, and I would obtain the, the following answer. I need five heat exchangers because I have four streams plus two utility minus one because I have one in independent system. Okay, so it means that I have now a way to calculate what is the minimum number of connection. However, what we have also to recognize is that when we were looking at the pinch, we have learned that the pinch was telling us that the two systems above the pinch and below the pinch needs to be independent. Okay, so it means that if I want to reach the minimum number of connections, I'm not in addition, allow to exchange heat across the pinch, okay? Which means that I'm going to make the analysis of what is happening above the pinch and what is happening below the pinch, and the minimum number of connections will be the minimum number above plus the minimum number below the pinch. So it means that uh, I will have to count what is happening above the pinch. Above the pinch, I do not have the cold utility, and I have uh, four streams, so it means that above the pinch I would need four heat exchangers, and below the pinch uh, I do not have hot utility, but I have uh, uh, again three streams, which means that I, in, in reality I would need uh, seven heat exchangers, so four above and three below the pinch. So what does it? Why do I have more than the five that I was expecting? Is because the streams that were above the pinch and below the pinch at the same time, so the one that were crossing the pinch, needs to be counted twice because there are ones above and ones below the pinch. Okay. So what does it mean? It means that I can uh, have at the end a new formula that allows me to calculate what is the minimum number of heat exchangers that are needed uh, to satisfy the minimum energy requirement and, and therefore not cross energy uh, across the pinch, which can be calculated by being the number of, of uh, heat exchangers above minus plus the number of heat exchangers below, which can also be translated into the number of streams, the total number of streams, including the utility, minus one, plus the number of streams that cause the pinch, minus one. Okay, and why do I have twice minus one? The first minus one is because the whole system is in balance. So it means that the whole system is satisfying the, uh, the, the energy re requirement. And in addition, uh, the subsystem that is below or the subsystem that is above is also in balance. Okay, so the hot utility plus the hot streams equal the cold stream above the pitch. So in, indeed, I have two subsystems that are independent, and this is the reason why I have to have, add here the minus one. To be really complete, we have also to identify that it might happen that some streams are exactly imbalance inside the system. So this might happen. It is not, uh, so it is mainly because I want to be sure that the theory is valid, but in reality, it's really rare that we go into this situation where the heat load of one stream or a subset of stream is exactly equal to the heat load of uh, the, the list of the uh, corresponding uh, core streams, okay? It's really rare because typically when the process is operated, then the flows, uh, flows mismatch that typically not reach the equilibrium, but, uh, or the, the balance. But this is, uh, I would say, um, a rare situation, but uh, uh, it means that normally we have to add, to, to identify if there are independent subsystems in the subsystems, okay? But I, as I told you, is quite rare. So now I have, on the one hand, the total area, and on the other hand, the total, the minimum number of connections. So it means that now what I can do is to try to say, okay, why don't we just consider that uh, one heat exchanger in the system is in fact by dividing among the total area, uh, uh, distributing sorry, the, the total uh, area over the minimum number of connections. 
Okay? And this will, will then give us the possibility of knowing what is the mean size of a heat exchanger in the system. And if I have the mean size of a heat exchanger in the system, I can then uh, deduce what will be the total cost of all the heat exchangers in the system, because it will be the number of connections times the cost of the mini heat exchanger. Okay? This is still an assumption. It's not sure that it is really what is going to happen in reality, because I'm not sure that all the heat exchangers will be exactly the same. It's possible that some uh, streams have big heat loads and others have small heat loads, which will then reduce, uh, 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 go towards uh, uh, small heat exchangers and big, big heat exchangers. But at least it's a way to have this ex uh, estimation. In, in reality, it's an overestimation. I'm showing you uh, here. Let's assume that I have two um, heat exchangers that have an area of uh, a total sum of 80. So it means that if one heat exchanger, for example, has A2, the second one has the, the, the complementary part here. Okay? And I can then, uh, and let's assume now that I have uh, the, the, this representation here with the curve here, which represents the cost of the heat exchanger, of one heat exchanger, which means that if I have uh, one area A2 here, it will correspond to C2, to which I have to add this part here, which is C3. And I will end up by a sum. So for example, the C2 plus C3 is going to be to reach here. I, I will end up by um, uh, having a sum that will have a maximum when the A1 is equal to A2. So A2 is equal to A3, sorry. Okay, so it means that the, the, the area is equal to half of the area, which is the assumption that I have taken. So it means that now I have at least uh, a way to estimate what is the total cost, the upper bound of on the total cost. So it means that every other combination I know that it will be cheaper than the amount that I have uh, calculated. Okay? So it's a way to be on the safe side. And now what I'm going to do is that as soon as I have this, uh, I have an estimation of the cost, so I have an estimation of uh, the investment that I can compare with the, uh, uh, with the cost of the uh, heat that is recovered. And what I'm going to do now is to modify the value of the delta T minimum in a systematic way, calculate the total area uh, corresponding, because I know what is the distance between the two curves which allows me to calculate the vertical uh, heat exchanges uh, here, right? Knowing the vertical heat exchanges, uh, I can calculate the temperature difference, the Lagrange mean of the temperature difference. Knowing the heat transfer coefficients of each of the streams, I'm able to calculate what will be the total area. And knowing the position of the pinch point, I know who is crossing the pinch, which means that I know how many heat exchangers I will need. And then, then afterwards, I can deduce by knowing the, the number of heat, the total area and the number of heat exchangers. I can deduce what is the uh, cost of the mean heat exchanger that I multiply by the number of heat exchangers to have the investment. Okay, so now I can do exactly the same as what I was doing for one single heat exchanger and look at where is the best solution. I will have a, a situation that will be a little bit different from what I know in the past because it's possible that the pinch point will change the position. So if I'm moving this curve uh, in this direction, you can see that I'm going to follow this line first, and then afterwards, when I will be here, I will follow. Uh, so if I'm a small one, I will be here, and a big one, I will be here. So I will follow this line, and then afterwards this line. Which means that the operating cost is going to be a broken line, like this. And as the pinch point is changing, it's possible that the number of streams is going also to change which means that the cost of the, heat ex uh, the mean heat exchanger is going to change and the number of heat exchangers is going to change, which means that at the level of the investment, I can have a, 
a strange curve like this one, for example, with a decrease here, then a jump because the pitch is changing, and then uh, a, a, a new decrease. And the goal will be to identify where is the best delta t minimum value. And why, when I'm saying where is the best delta t minimum value, is mainly what is a collection of streams that are above and below the pinch. Okay? And of course, if the, the pinch is changing the position, then I will have another list of streams that I will use for the heat exchanger network design. Right? So it means that it will not be so easy to decide uh, where, where do we have to start, and therefore this analysis allows us to say, okay, I think that it would be better to start when the, those two streams, for example, can exchange one with the other. Afterwards, uh, I can see that the minimum will not be uh, as uh, attractive, so don't try to, to start with this, uh, uh, this level. Okay, so and this allows us to, to uh, uh, identify what is the best value of the delta t minimum. In addition, when we, when we are doing this, it might happen that there will be things that will appear from the analysis. An example is seen here. With small values, this heat exchange is valid uh, and, and uh, compatible with uh, uh, the exchange between this and this is uh, compatible. With higher value, it's not possible anymore. Right? So it means that this heat exchanger is directly identified because it appears to be uh, feasible for small value of the delta t minimum and impossible otherwise. So the idea in, in this case is take this heat exchanger, evaluate it, look at the cost of the heat recovery and the associated investment and decide if it makes sense or not to install it. Then the, if, if you decide yes, then you can start doing the calculation with the remaining problem analysis, and then you redo. You can restart the calculations from, from scratch. Okay, but with by having decided that this heat exchanger exists, if now the heat exchanger appears not to be useful, then you know that you have to use a bigger delta t minimum, and then you have to progress with this bigger delta t minimum and continue the calculations. Um, something which is also interesting in this analysis is, the, is that we have added into the calculations the possibility of taking into account the value of the heat transfer coefficient. Uh, taking into account the value of the heat transfer coefficient means that uh, we will be able to some extent to see in the calculation of, of the heat exchanger area the importance of uh, streams that have that are uh, that have a facility or that that are easy for doing the heat exchange compared to others that uh, have a very bad heat transfer coefficient and that would cost a lot. Okay, so assuming a, a total a unique value for the delta t minimum is therefore not so um, would not be so comfortable if if all the streams are with hot water. I would, not, don't care, I would not care, but if I have on the one hand a stream that is doing evaporation and on the other hand a gas that needs to be cooled down, then I would say that a priori the delta T minimum for the gas will be much higher than the one for a fluid that is going to evaporate. So what we can do then is to say, okay, instead of using a, a single value for all the streams, what I can do perhaps is to try to allocate a contribution to the delta T minimum that is related to the heat transfer coefficient of a fluid. Okay? Uh, which means that in this case, the delta T minimum will be in fact the sum of a contribution from the hot and a contribution to the cold. So now, how do I calculate those two values? In fact, when I'm considering that um, the compromise between the additional amount of uh, uh, money spent for um, buying the heat exchanger is compensating the cost of uh, the energy saving, I can calculate the derivative with respect to the heat transfer coefficient of each of the streams. Okay. And by doing this, I will be able to identify that a 
the contribution of a given stream that has a given heat load and a given heat exchange, heat transfer coefficient is proportional to, uh, to a reference value, sorry, the delta T minimum is proportional to the ratio between the heat load and the heat transfer coefficient. And the exponent of this uh, uh, proportionality is in fact a function of the exponent of the investment of the heat exchanger. Okay? This is based on the fact that I want to always stay on the optimum. And the derivative that I can see here, the, the exponent that I can see here is in fact coming from the exponent that I have in the cost formula of the heat exchanger. But what does it mean? It means that if I know the delta T minimum for one of the stream, I can always calculate the delta T minimum for the other streams. And I give you here uh, order of magnitude on how, uh, what will be the variations of the delta T minimum if I'm changing the heat transfer coefficient for uh, the same heat load. In addition to this, then it means that I'm now able to differentiate the gas from the liquid, from the evaporation, from the condensation, which is quite important uh, if I want to be sure to start with the, the, the appropriate uh, delta T minimum. And there is still one degree of freedom because uh, what I have said is that I can calculate the value if I know the value of a reference stream, which is expressed here by this element here. And what I'm going to do is that instead of changing the value of the delta T minimum, I'm going to change the value of the reference stream. And I will do the same, exactly the same calculation. So I'm going to uh, calculate the compromise uh, that was uh, expressed uh, here, sorry. I will do exactly the same, but instead of having delta T minimum here and the same for everyone, I will have a, a multiplication and we, I will have specific delta T minimum contributions related to each of the stream that will be calculated as a function of the heat load and as a function of uh, the heat transfer coefficient. Okay? Having said that, this, then uh, I have still to see how do I calculate now the heat cascades when I have different contributions for the different streams. And for doing this, in fact, uh, it's quite simple. I'm just going to revisit a little bit the definition of the corrected temperatures that I need, I was using for calculating the heat cascade. So if you well remember, I was, uh, for calculating the corrected temperatures, I was taking the real temperature and then deducting the delta T minimum, half of the contribution of the delta T minimum for uh, the hot stream and adding half of the delta T minimum to the cold stream. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to recalculate all the temperatures, but now I, I will have a correction which will not be the full delta T minimum divided by two, but the one that I have just calculated. So now I have a contribution, um, uh, a temperature, which is a uh, corrected temperature that depends on the heat load of the heat exchanger and uh, of the heat transfer coefficient that is calculated by the formula that I have just used here. Okay, so knowing this, then I will calculate a new list of temperatures. And for this new list of corrected temperatures, I can write the heat cascade. So the heat cascade is not going to change. Okay, the only thing that is going to change is that the corrected temperatures that appears here are now specific to each of the streams. Okay, but as soon as I have this corrected temperature here, knowing this one, then I will be able to make to, to redo all the calculation in a systematic way. Which means that I will be able to identify what is the pinch point and the location of the uh, uh, and the minimum energy requirement as a function of this big value of the delta T minimum uh, multiplier that I um, uh, that I have identified. And then what I will do is that I will mo modify this value until I find the right value of this delta T minimum multiplier that realizes the best compromise between the investment 
of the heat exchange, uh, of the heat exchangers and the um, uh, heat recovery. Now I'm talking about the whole system, not anymore one heat exchanger, uh, which increases the chances that I have to find the best heat exchanger network design with the appropriate delta T minimum that will be done for the whole system. Once I have done this, then I will have uh, the information that allows me to uh, be sure about the uh, uh, place to start with the heat exchanger network design, but I will have also a very good indication, which is an overestimation of how much I will have to invest in order to buy all the heat exchangers that are needed to do the heat recovery. So two important informations, therefore, on the one hand, what is the best, where do I have to start the heat exchanger network design? And the, the other information is what is the best, what is the estimated cost? So how much will I, will I have to invest in order to realize the heat recovery? Okay, so it means that from there, I will be ready to really start the, the pinch design method with uh, a much better definition of where the delta T minimum is located. Okay? Questions? No question? Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to combine a smaller stream with another one? Uh, or would that be a bad idea for reducing the number of people? Yeah, so, so the, the combining big or small one doesn't have any impact okay. on uh, the number of heat exchangers because I, at the end what we do is that we, we always uh, try to reach the minimum number of heat exchangers, okay? Uh, and what the theory is telling us is that as soon as you connect one stream with another one, you have to try to satisfy the needs of one of the two, yeah. okay? So it means that if you connect a big one with a small one, the small one will decide what is the heat load, which means that uh, you will need a small heat exchanger. Okay? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, from the practical point of view, and that's why we have this heuristic rules that says, let's try to start with the big MCP first, it's better to have equilibrated heat exchanger. Because if you have a small flow, uh, with a big delta, uh, big temperature difference, that exchange with a big flow with a small temperature difference, uh, it might happen that you will have problems to control also. So that's why we recommend to try to match the one that has the same order of magnitude in delta T. Okay? So there will be a lot of, of uh, limits that will be imposed by the ratio between the, the, the CP of the streams, which is uh, at the end appearing in the definition of the MCP rules, huh? in reality. So you will not be allowed to do what you want. But otherwise, I cannot answer you. So, so at the end, you will, you will nevertheless uh, have to uh, make the full evaluation to be sure. Okay? So other questions? If not, then I'm going to... Um, make a short break and then after the the uh, the break i'm going to explain um, what is happening if i have made a heat exchanger network design because i did end up with uh, all the information that was needed to do the heat exchanger network design and to verify that the structure that i have designed is the best one or can i make an evolution of the heat exchanger network design that allows me, for example, to buy less heat exchangers and perhaps to pay a little bit more in energy. Okay?